Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to Ridgeway Church. Of course, this can never be as good, can it, as actually uh, being together as a church family on, on a Sunday, on the Lord's Day. But nevertheless, we can be together in spirit this morning. And so as we tune in together, we, we pray, don't we, that the Lord will be among us um, to bless us. And uh, if you are a visitor with us this morning, you are especially welcome. It could be that you're just in the early stages of exploring the Christian faith for yourself. And uh, if that is you, can I direct you to our church website, especially if it is this coronavirus pandemic, which has prompted you to start exploring things for yourself. You'll find on the church homepage a link called Hope Beyond Coronavirus, and it would definitely be worth um, you having a look at that. Well, for the church family, there's just one notice. This morning, don't forget that we're going to be meeting together for prayer this Wednesday at 8 p.m. So please do tune in. That's 8 p.m. on Wednesday, and I'll be sending out the Zoom notifications as soon as possible. Well, we're going to begin our time together this morning with prayer. So let's pray together now. Father, Son and Spirit, our great triune God, we come this morning together into your glorious presence. God the Father, we worship you as the God who is the Lord of life and death, of heaven and earth and of salvation and judgment. We thank you that you so loved us and this world that you sent your Son that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. God the Son, we worship you this morning as the fairest of 10,000, as the one who is altogether lovely and the friend of sinners. And God the Spirit, be powerfully at work among us, we pray. Be binding up the brokenhearted, be rebuking the hard-hearted, be encouraging the tender-hearted and in all things and everywhere this morning please be giving us more of Christ because he is the author and perfecter of our faith and in his name we pray amen well the psalm writer begins one of his psalms in this way O oh lord our lord how majestic is your name in all the earth Oh, 
That's only got good news in it. What do you say? So, I'm ready. Are you ready, boy? Bring it on, bring it on. Is, is, that, is that it? Is that, is that the best you can... Okay, this is Marshall Marshmallow with the imaginary good news news show. So, good news. We can all go and play in the park again. And good news. We can go to school again and see our friends. And good news, we can see our family again. That's it for now, folks. Thanks. This is Marshall Marshmallow saying, have a good day. Bye. <laughs> that was fun. Hey, and that was the fourth thing we've learned in lockdown, boys and girls. The fourth thing we've learned in lockdown is we all need good news. That's right. We all need good news. So join me next time when we do... Seven things we've learned in lockdown. This is your friend Marshall saying goodbye. Goodbye. I'm going to call my grandma in New York. I'm going to go see her. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good news. Thank you, Marshall. I think we needed that. And boys and girls, did you spot some good news as well from Marshall? His arm doesn't hurt anymore, does it? I didn't spot a sling. And there's been other good news this weekend, hasn't there? As we've celebrated 75 years since the end of the Second World War, we have had the privilege of living in peace for all of that time. Good news indeed. But you know that in the Bible, the word gospel means good news. We think about the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, who wrote down the good news of Jesus. And now we're learning in the book of Acts what happened after Jesus died and rose again, as the gospel spread beyond Jerusalem. But you know, there were some people who really didn't like that. The religious leaders, they were really jealous. They saw the crowds gathering around the apostles as Peter and the others healed and taught people that everyone needs to turn to God. Those religious leaders, they were so mad about that that they had the apostles arrested and thrown into prison. Josh is going to read us the true story from Acts chapter 3 and look out for Katie's artwork. The reading is from Acts chapter 5, verse 17 to 25. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail, 
and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and all his associates arrived, they called together the San Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and his chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts, teaching the people. Wow, an amazing story from Acts again. The apostles, in that dark prison cell, and in the middle of the night, an angel appeared. The big heavy doors swung open. They walked past the guards. The gates opened of their own accord and the apostles were free. And they did exactly what the angel told them. They went out to teach people about Jesus. And the next morning, well, the captain of the temple guard had no idea that all of that had happened. And when he went to fetch the apostles, well, he went through the enormous gates. There were the guards, through the heavy doors. But where were the apostles? They weren't there. And then somebody came running up and said to him, those men you arrested, they're out teaching people about Jesus. Well, that captain was pretty angry. He wanted to go and arrest them. But then he was afraid of the crowd. So instead, he kind of asked them politely if they wouldn't mind coming along to be questioned by the religious leaders. Peter and the apostles weren't afraid at all. And when Peter appeared in front of the religious leaders, he told them this. He said, God wants everyone to know this good news about Jesus. He's given us his Holy Spirit and we need to obey him. Well, the religious leaders were so angry they wanted to kill the apostles. But one of them, called Gamaliel, stood up and said, Don't do that. If these men really are from God, we shouldn't stop them. In fact, we won't be able to stop them. <laughs> and so the apostles were flogged and sent home. Were they sad about that? No. They went straight back to teaching people about Jesus because God knows that we all need good news. Well, we're going to pray together now for a few moments. Now, in a minute, I'm going to lead us. We're going to firstly pray for our nation and then we're going to be praying for Paul and Melanie Stone and the family. But before we do that, uh, we're going to have a time of confession. We do, of course, come before the throne of grace this morning as the people of God confidently. But we also come humbly, don't we? In Christ Jesus, we are children of God forever. Nothing can change that because of the finished work of Jesus. But the truth is, we've still failed to be what we ought to have been in this last week. And so how can we not confess now? together those things for which Jesus died. Before we do that, why don't we just pause very briefly so that we can call to mind those specific things or some of those specific things from this past week that we feel particularly convicted about this morning. So let's just very briefly pause. <clears throat> Well, we're going to pray together now. The words are going to appear on the screen. So let's pray this prayer of confession together. Most merciful God, we have we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father. We are mindful 
that it often takes a crisis for people like us to ponder the meaning of life and you. How we pray that that indeed would be happening in our nation right now. We've had so many of our crutches and props taken from us. So many of our escapisms snatched away. So, so many of our comforts have proved inadequate and we feel our mortality. But we know, Father, that there is a solid joy and lasting treasure that can only be found in our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that men, uh, women and children in our nation would be reaching out for you during this testing time because you are not far from each one of them. We thank you, Father, for what the surveys seem to suggest, uh, that there, uh, there has been a renewed interest in spiritual things, especially amongst the 18 to 30s. Please might each and every one of them find their way to the Jesus of the Bible because we know that he is manna to the hungry soul. Bring revival to our nation, we pray. And may we as a church at Ridgeway be able to get caught up in that. And we ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our great God and Father, we bring to you this morning Paul and Mel and Neve and Joseph and Billy. It is difficult and it is weird and it is frustrating to be kept distant from this dear family at this time. But you are always near to your broken hearted and you collect their tears in a bottle. We thank you so very much that you are the God of all grace and the God of all hope. Even as we bring them to you now, please would you remind them that you love them. We pray that you would prolong Melanie's life. We pray that her pain may be less. We ask that the promises of your words to them would sustain them, that the love of others would encourage them. And would you be working in them right now, all that would be for their good and your glory. We pray for faith, hope and love. And even in the heartache and anguish of the moment, please would there be much peace about what is still to come. And so we bring this dear family to you now. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to be continuing our studies in the Old Testament book of Esther this morning. And it's, it's very exciting to have John and Sean to uh, bring us some news from Japan and then to bring our Esther Bible reading to us. Well, good morning and greetings from Sapporo, Japan, where the snow is finally melted and the cherry blossoms are out. Uh, it's great to be with you, sort of with you, um, via a screen uh, this morning for the Ridgeway service. Um, we love you all, we miss you. Um, and you're very much in our prayers. And it's been wonderful uh, for us to see many of your faces on the Ridgeway Online service. Thank you too for your prayers for us, which we appreciate very much indeed. Um, Simon has asked me, uh, or asked one of us to do the Bible reading. And before that, just to give you a little bit of news uh, from here. So Japan too is affected by the coronavirus, as you'll know. Uh, we're not quite in a full lockdown like the UK, but we have an emergency situation declared until the end of May, um, which restricts life and church life. Um, so we're also not able to meet on Sundays um, or for other, uh, other things. And... Um, so we're putting sermons and children's messages on YouTube. We're hoping that the emergency situation will be lifted by the end of May and we'll be able to go back into some sort of normality um, in June. But 
Only the Lord knows uh, what will happen. In the meantime, we pray that the Lord will use this time uh, for our good. Uh, we are in a very similar situation, I guess, to many of you. Um, we're doing okay, but all four of us, especially the children, are missing having more human contact and uh, missing some of the places that we would normally uh, like to go. Um, in terms of the church, we are blessed with by various things, even in the midst of the unusual and difficult situation that we have uh, with coronavirus at the moment. We were due next Sunday, the 17th, to be baptising five people. Uh, we're not able to do that. They're, that's going to have to be delayed. But we praise the Lord for um, that great work that he has done here in leading them uh, to faith. We're also grateful that a number of people who don't normally come on a Sunday but are connected to the church have been watching our services or our sermons on YouTube. And we pray uh, for fruit in their lives. And um, just a bit of hot off the press news um, or hot off the press encouragement. I um, went out of the church building uh, earlier on and a lady from the block of flats next door was standing outside looking at our sign and she said, oh, are you from the church here? I said, yes, I am. Uh, she said, I've been thinking I'd really like to come along uh, to one of your services um, when the coronavirus uh, is over. Uh, can I come? So you can pray for her and um, we praise the Lord for that opportunity. Well, we're going to have our Bible reading now. Uh, we're still in Esther. And today I'm going to read for you Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the peoples of, people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away 
and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Well, boys and girls, uh, if you are aged between 7 and 12, now is the time for you to take up a Bible sheet and a Bible, because we're going to be looking at that part of God's Word together. Well, all she wanted was a quiet life. Uh, she'd been queen for five years. Uh, things have been fairly uneventful in that time. She'd had, I'm sure, the usual round of state functions and polite handshakes and royal dinners. There was probably rarely much excitement. But life was comfortable enough. Actually, that was where she liked it. But all that was about to change. In his romantic comedy, Twelfth Night, William Shakespeare has the character Malvolio saying these words. Some people are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. While the latter was Esther. She's destined to become a very unlikely and very reluctant hero. In fact, if it wasn't for the, chap uh, the events of this chapter, we wouldn't even know about her. And she, I, I suspect, would have been very happy with that. But the Lord God had other ideas. Last week, you'll hopefully remember, we saw the, the making of a, a truly diabolical plan to exterminate the Persian Jews. It was hatched by a thug called Haman and rubber stamped by corrupt King Xerxes. And, and now, as we come to the beginning of chapter four, the clock is very much ticking. It wasn't going to be long before the terrible slaughter would begin. And so as we come to scene one of chapter four, it is not surprising that we find a thing of great grief and great anguish. Uh, we find an empire shaken to its core and the people waiting to die. Uh, just look with me at verses one to three. Uh, we meet Mordecai, um, Esther's resourceful and, and principled cousin. But we find him wailing in sackcloth and ashes. And we're told that the Jewish people everywhere are joining him. Is genocide going to be how it ends? Is this it? Well, we don't know yet, but by the end of the chapter, there is at least a glimmer of hope. I think one, what chapter four is about more than anything else is Esther's coming out. Um, this major crisis for the people of God precipitates a personal crisis for her. Because of everybody on the stage right now, she is the only one who can help. As we're about to see, at first she really doesn't want to. But she really needs to, and eventually she will. Crises uh, can be the making of people, can't they? Um, this current pandemic will be changing many of us for the better, I'm sure. We'll be appreciating each other much more come the end of it. I'm sure we'll be more grateful for the simple freedoms that we normally enjoy. And we will become and are becoming, aren't we, more aware of how fragile and fleeting life is. And perhaps in the light of that, there will be some people who will make their peace with God for the first time as a result of this crisis. Maybe that will be you. Well, this crisis that we've got in front of us this morning, well, that's going to force the issue for Esther. Thus far, she's been safely and comfortably cocooned in the royal palace. Uh, she's become, over these five years, part of the pagan furniture. She is very much at home in what we've called the kingdom of this world. But now she needs to decide. Because of this crisis, she needs to decide who she is and who she is for. And it's her wrestling with that issue that really dominates the rest of the chapter. She takes some convincing, but it's to the great relief of Mordecai and his people that ultimately she comes down on the right side. I've given this morning's message the title, Cometh the Hour, for obvious reasons. 
And uh, we're going to trace this movement together now. Uh, this movement in Esther from passive and detached at the beginning to decisive and brave at the end. And friends, as we walk through it together now, uh, as we do so, let's be thinking, firstly, what is here for us? And secondly, how do we see Jesus? And at the end, when we uh, walk through the chapter, we're going to come back to those two things together. Well, this journey begins with Esther living in a completely different world. She's meant to be a part of the covenant people of God, but she really is that in name only. Um, look down with me at verses four to five. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hattak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her and ordered him to go and find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. It's very striking, isn't it? That uh, when Esther hears of her cousin's distress, she's not got a clue what's going on. Despite there being a threat to the very survival of the Jews, she's got absolutely no idea. You would think that would be that's somewhat ironic, given that she's the queen and you think, therefore, she's kind of at the centre of things. But I think the point here is that this, what we're being shown here, is a measure of how far she has travelled in the wrong direction. Um, distance is everything here. Do you notice right at the outset there is distance? Um, we've got Mordecai. Where is he? Well, he's on the outside with his people. Esther, on the other hand, is on the inside in a completely different world. And because of that distance, uh, she can't even speak to Mordecai directly. Uh, she has to send a messenger to go backwards and forwards. And, and, and that going backwards and forwards is it goes on throughout this chapter. But I think the point for us is that's not a good sign. Well, she understandably wants to know what's going on with Mordecai. So in verses six to eight, Mordecai fires off back to her an urgent uh, no holds bar reply. And uh, he basically tells her everything. Uh, he even gives her a copy of the written decree uh, to, to be taken back with the eunuch that contains all the gory details. He, he wants to spare her nothing. She needs to know what's going on. He's desperate to wake her up. And then he orders her to go and plead with the king. Um, at the end of verse eight, I think there's something that's, that's really quite interesting. I think at the end of verse eight, we have a, a kind of fascinating twist of the knife. Uh, it's interesting that Mordecai begs her to do what? Well, he begs her to plead with him, that's the king, for her people. The, these people who are in danger, they are her people. Oh, but are they? It sure doesn't look like it. And it really hasn't looked like it since she became queen. I think it's very interesting that um, Esther is the only character in this story with two names. We noted that back in chapter one. Esther is her Persian name, but she's got a Jewish name as well. Her Jewish name is Hadassah. And I think what's going on here, is, here now is effectively that she's being asked to choose. Which of those is her primary identity? Is she Persian or is she Jewish? In other words, does she belong to this world? Or does she belong to the Old Testament church? Well, this eunuch Hattak heads back inside uh, with Mordecai's appeal. Uh, he, get, he takes it back to Esther and we hold our breath. What is she going to do? Will she continue to listen to Mordecai? She always has. 
Will she line up with her people in their hour of need? Or will she count the cost and decide that it's just not worth her while? Well, let's have a look at what she does, verses 10 to 11. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law that they be put to death. Unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Friends, make no mistake, this would have been a very risky thing for Esther to do. Uh, as we, we see there, an audience with this king was by invitation only. Uh, there's a chance it would be OK. And normally you would think, wouldn't you, that the queen would, if no one else would, she would be in with a shout, especially considering the way that he used to gush over her. But it's 30 days now since they've seen each other. It would appear that the honeymoon was well and truly over and he seems to have completely lost interest in her. So now she has no real reason to think that it would she would be well received and it would end well. Well, given all that, she does what I suspect most of us would have done. And she says, Mordecai, you've got to be kidding. Friends, self-preservation um, is a very powerful impulse, isn't it, in all of us? Especially, especially when we're living for nothing greater than ourselves or our, and our own comfort and our own security, which appears to have been the case for Esther. Sometimes, though, the question is an obvious one, isn't it? Will we do the right thing or the easy thing? Will we do the right thing or the easy thing when it comes to home life? When it comes to the workplace? When it comes to our neighbourhood or church? Will we do the right thing or will we do the easy thing? Friends, which is our default on that? To do the right thing or to do the easy thing? Well, that was uh, what Esther was confronted with. And there's no question that at this stage that Esther would prefer to stay safely under cover. But Mordecai, her parent guardian, knows that now this is no longer an option. And look at what he says to her in verses 12 to 14. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king, because you are in the king's house, that you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place that you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? But that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Those words are probably the best known words in this book of Esther, and for good reason. Uh, they're the hinge, really, on which the story turns. There's a deep pathos or profundity about them, isn't there? And also they're, they're the closest thing we get in the book to, to bringing the God of Israel uh, out into the open. There's a lot here that we could think about, but for our purposes this morning, just, just note the basic gist of what Mordecai is saying. He's basically saying to Esther, Esther, like it or not, this is your moment. Like it or not, this is your moment. In verses 13 and 14, there are, there are basically uh, there are two main parts to to that. Firstly, in verse 13 and the beginning of verse 14, Mordecai basically says to her, look, Esther, that there is no easy way out here. You can't hide anymore. It's interesting that Esther has said to Mordecai, look, if I do this thing, I'm going to die. 
And Mordecai says it's back to her effectively, he says, look, if you don't do this, you're going to die. What sort of choice is that? The only issue for her is really whether she's going to going to die doing the right thing or the wrong thing. So firstly, he says to her, look, Esther, there is no easy way out here. But secondly, he says to her, look, Esther, this thing now, this thing that's happening, this may well be your destiny. And who knows, he says, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai knows uh, what Esther should know, that there are no true accidents in this world. The hidden hand of God is always at work. Now, it's true that he can't be certain that this is why Esther has been brought to this point. That is why he says, who knows? He can't be sure. You can't read providence that precisely. But we can be sure that there are no coincidences. And friends, let me say to you this morning, that very much goes for each of us too. There's nothing about who we are or where we are this morning that is an accident. Perhaps you're here and you're wondering. Perhaps life's not turned out as you expected it to. Well, friends, be in no doubt. We are where we are for a reason. There are no accidents. And if you are in Christ, if you are a child of God, you can be absolutely sure it's a good reason. It is a worthy reason. It is a right reason. We know, don't we, that uh, the Lord has his unique discipleship program for each of us. And so, friends, wherever we are right now, the Lord has not forgotten about you. Do you believe that? Well, Esther's caught between a, a rock and a hard place. I guess there is only one third option. There is a, there is a third option, but only one. I guess she could uh, keep her head down and hope for a miracle. But it, it is to her great credit that she doesn't go for that. Because now a new Esther is emerging. Uh, whatever reservations remain in her head and her heart, and I'm sure there were some, it is to her immense credit that we see now, right at the end, that she's willing to risk everything to do the right thing. Just look at verses 15 to 17. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Friends, isn't this thrilling what we see here in Esther? Do you see the progress? Three things stand out for me. First of all, she's no longer passive. She's actually doing something. Secondly, she's fasting. Fasting, of course, is a religious act. It is a form of petition or prayer to God. Before this point, she's, she's shown very little sign of faith or fear of the Lord. That's changing. But then the final bit of progress we see here is also very striking. And that is that she is now one with her people. We talked last time about the sense of being all in it together that we've got at this, this pandemic time in the UK. Well, as we go back to Esther, we notice now, at last, they're all in it together. Do you see? Uh, the text makes great play of the fact that they're fasting together. This is not just Esther doing her thing or them doing their thing. They're doing it together. At the outset, she wasn't one of them, but now she is. Friends, look how far she's come. She's decided who she is. 
Her faith and her people will define her. She will stand with them, even if it means she'll perish. Friends, at last, she is becoming the woman that we hoped that she would be. Well, friends, as we uh, come back to us and draw some things together, there are uh, two timeless lessons, it seems uh, to me, for us here. Uh, let's just look at them now briefly in turn. The first thing that we see through this whole episode is this. We see that we need a saviour who stands with us. We need a saviour who stands with us. Now, in this sense, Esther is Jesus. Now, of course, there are differences. I can think of at least a couple. Firstly, Jesus uh, doesn't stand with us reluctantly. Uh, in fact, the Bible says the whole reason that God became man was to stand with us. I love the way the writer to the Hebrews says that uh, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. So unlike Esther, he doesn't stand with us reluctantly. A and neither was it the case with Jesus that he was just willing to die to save. With Jesus, it was so much more than that. He wanted to die to save because he had to die to save. I think something that uh, there's something very interesting for us here in verse 14. Did you notice that Mordecai says that uh, if Esther would not step up, then God would raise up another to save his people, if that's what it would take. But of course, for us, Jesus is the only way. There is no other. Uh, so Esther and Jesus are by no means identical. But we do still see Jesus in Esther here. Because we too need a saviour. The Bible says, doesn't it, that as human beings, we too are under the sentence of death. And we're very aware of that at the moment because people are dying. And we can see that that is the universal human condition. But actually, the Bible says it's worse than that. The Bible says we're heading for eternal destruction without Jesus. Oh, there's only one way that we could be saved. Uh, it was through the salvation and the mediation of another, just like it was with Esther and her people. It is through the salvation and mediation of another who is one of us, but so much more than us. Oh, friends, this is Esther's moment. The cross was Jesus' moment and our moment. So let me ask you this morning, who or what is your Esther? In other words, who or, who or what are you relying on to save you from the wrath to come? Perhaps it's another person, a, a priest maybe, or some other religious guru. Perhaps it's not another person. Perhaps it's something in you you're relying on. Perhaps your authenticity or your sincerity or your charity. Or is it just Jesus? The Bible says that it can be him and it has to be him. But is it him for you? Oh, that's the first thing we see here. Uh, we need a saviour who stands with us. But the second thing that we see here in this chapter is that we need the courage to stand with him. The first of these two points is Esther as Jesus. But uh, in this second point, we have Esther as an example to us. Uh, it's very easy, isn't it, for us to be armchair critics and uh, underestimate the raw courage of this young woman. Sure, at, at the beginning, she was no kind of hero, but by the end, wow. She was willing to lay down her life for her people. When she goes to the king, as we've seen, there are no guarantees. She knows how disposable Persian, uh, Persian queens are. And yet she's willing to die. She's willing to die for her faith and her people and her God. 
Friends, would we have been in that situation? Would we have taken up our cross in that way? You might have heard of uh, a man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm sure you have. He was a, a German Lutheran pastor in the first half of the 20th century. And uh, he's most famous for his resistance to um, Hitler and the Nazis during the Second World War. And in 1937, his classic work called The Cost of Discipleship was published. And it was essentially a series of reflections on the Sermon on the Mount. And it's in that work that he says this, and just listen carefully, because it's absolutely for us this morning. This is what he says. The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering, which every man must experience, is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man, which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. And on the 9th of April 1945, that is what he did. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hanged by the Nazis in Flossenburg concentration camp. Well, friend, most of us, uh, for most of us, it will be nowhere near as dramatic as that, will it? But even if it doesn't mean martyrdom, it still means death. It means death to self. That's what Jesus means when he talks about us taking up our cross and following him. Death to self. So let me ask the question this morning, who are we more like? Are we more like the old Esther, comfortable, compromised, invisible, undercover, anything for an easy life, me first? Or are we more like the new Esther, willing to do the right thing over the easy thing, putting others first and self second, being a public believer rather than a private one? And even ready to put it all on the line for Jesus, if that's what it would take. Friends, where are, where are we right now? Are we more with the old Esther or the new Esther? Friends, we know, don't we, that in the gospel, we have a saviour who fully identifies with us. On the cross, he stood in for us and right now he intercedes for us. There is no holding back with Jesus. He has taken up his cross for us and nothing can or will change that, praise God. But have we taken up our cross for him? That's the question for us this morning.
Well, as we draw things to a close this morning, let me share with you these words of blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us always. Amen.